Good morning and welcome to Emerald Ashbor University. This is Robin Osborne from Michigan State University. My EAB University colleagues are Professors Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University and Amy Stone from Ohio State University Extension. And today we are happy to share with you the presentation entitled Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, Everything You Need to Know in a Half an Hour, presented by EAB University's own Elizabeth Barnes. This webinar is made possible through funding by the USDA Forest Service. Elizabeth is the exotic forest pest educator with the Department of Entomology at Purdue University. She received her doctorate in ecology from the University of Denver, where she specialized in plant insect interactions and studied tent caterpillars and fall webworms. She currently works on science communications and invasive species outreach at Purdue. We welcome your comments and questions today. So please feel free to type them in either the chat pod or the Q&A pod, and Elizabeth will be answering them right after this presentation. Tomorrow, you will receive an email with a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that we hope you will take the time to fill out. It helps us bring these free educational webinars to you. The web, this email will also include our present presenter's contact information, as well as information on how to obtain CEUs for viewing the live webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing later on the EAB University page of the www.emeraldashbor.info website. So thank you for attending today, everyone. And Elizabeth, you can unmute your microphone and begin your presentation. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're about to start presenting to you Hemlock Willia Dilgid, everything you need to know in half an hour. But first, I wanted to just reiterate what Robin had said about the surveys. It would be very helpful for us if you could fill those out um, because these series of videos are sort of an experiment for us. Uh, we decided that this year, in addition to our regular EAB University programming, we'd also bring you these half an hour programs that are focused in on a overview view of a single invasive species each. Uh, if you like these videos, please do let us know that in the survey. And if you don't like them, we'd like to hear that too. Uh, we, we really want to know if this is something you'd like us to provide for you in the future. Um, or, you know, if you don't like it, we will try something else. So again, thank you for coming. And I will hand things over to Cliff. In this presentation, I'm going to give you some information about uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid and i think i'd start off by uh, giving you the punchline first of all hemlock trees a very important tree in uh, the eastern forest in north america are threatened by hemlock woolly adelgid but uh, there are some chemical controls uh, that are available that can protect trees for five to seven years this is quite useful in urban areas however in uh, recreational lands and forest lands, biological and chemical control uh, are uh, effective, especially if they're integrated to meet multiple management objectives. So why do we care about hemlocks? Uh, well, they're shade tolerant trees. They grow slow. They're very large species and they're sort of foundational for riparian areas. Uh, you know, after uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, you know, that stream that you saw before, you know, the, the microclimate changes, uh, the fauna in the stream changes, and also so does the uh, fish. So uh, it's a very important species in, in a lot of forests. So let's go through the biology and the basics of hemlock woolly adelgid. It was first discovered in North America in 1924, and it is currently found in 18 states. Uh, it showed up uh, surprisingly in the Port County, Indiana in 2012, which was a pretty scary thought, but uh, fortunately uh, it was uh, uh, delineated and they eradicated it and it hasn't really been seen since. So we dodged that bullet, although it is present in other parts of the Midwest, uh, most notably on some in some counties on the eastern shore of Lake Michigan in uh, the state of Michigan. So you can see that the distribution uh, of the hemlock adults pretty much stretches through much of its uh, continuous 
of the distribution of the hemlock species. There's a really nice guide that was recently published by the U.S. Forest Service that has a lot of the details that you would ever need to uh, manage the hemlock woolly adelgid. And a lot of the information that I'm talking about in this presentation, uh, I obtained from this guide. So let's start off with the biology and the basics of this adelgid. It comes from Japan, uh, and where it utilizes two hosts, uh, hemlock and, and spruce, to complete its life cycle. But in North America, it only feeds on hemlock. Uh, there are two generations a year, and it spreads uh, I, via the wind, uh, when the wind blows the crawling stage, or if the crawler stages are on uh, animals, uh, such as birds and or deer, and they move from tree to tree. Uh, what's an adelgid? They're small, dark, reddish-brown insects with a white woolly covering. Uh, here you see a woolly covering with a lot of eggs uh, in, in, inside them. Uh, and a female can lay up to 300 eggs in a lifetime, so they're quite capable of reproducing. And uh, the way it kills trees is by uh, having sucking mouth parts. So this is an electron micrograph of a hemlock woolly adelgid, and you can see the nice uh, wiry-like mouth parts uh, that will actually move themselves into the uh, needles of a hemlock, and they'll suck out the sap uh, in, in, in that way. Uh, once they, they move through the uh, palisade parenchyma layer, they will then uh, get, uh, rest in a, a phloem cell where look, they can suck sap uh, directly from uh, the vascular tissue. So uh, the, the uh, black uh, insects you see over here, these are actually uh, the young scales soon after the eggs have hatched. Uh, heavy infestations can kill trees in about three to four years. So uh, the death at times can be rather rapid. Um, this is the life cycle of the hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, in the summer, uh, we have a crawler stage, which is the uh, stage that comes out of the hatched egg. It'll then settle to feed. It'll molt several times in autumn. And then in, in the winter, uh, uh, the uh, males and, and the females will, will winter. Then in the springtime, uh, a second generation of crawlers will, will come out. And then uh, the uh, wingless females will lay eggs and start the life cycle all over again. Uh, there are some uh, male, some winged females that uh, will uh, be produced, but they uh, can't reproduce in North America. So uh, basically, they pretty much stay on uh, the twigs with needles. And this is what you'll see, is you'll see eggs uh, laid in white filaments of wax near the bases of the needles uh, you can, on, on this hemlock that you see over here. And, uh, you know, whether they are the wax strands produced by the females or the wax strands that are on the uh, uh, edges of the crawlers or the settlers, they're, they're, uh, these are somewhat waxy uh, insects. Uh, that you can find on the uh, hemlock. And here you see uh, the waxy filaments of uh, a female uh, that had laid the eggs, and then you see the small crawlers that are crawling around these brown crawlers with a white wax around the their edges and the margins uh, on the twig of a hemlock. So what do you want to look for uh, when you're looking for hemlocks with hemlock woolly adelgid? The hemlock might look ill. Uh, you definitely will see white filaments of wax on the hemlocks, and the wax will typically persist on the leaves after the, the uh, hemlock will the adelgids have died. So this is what I mean by a sickly-looking hemlock. It's a hemlock where uh, you see some thinning uh, that would not normally be associated uh, with the hemlock, and eventually it, it, it will kill it. Uh, but you also want to look out for lookalikes. There's a couple of other uh, white uh, 
structures that you might see on a hemlock. Uh, one could be a spider egg, sa egg sacs. That's probably fairly common. Uh, there are also uh, spittle bugs on the far right, which just looks like, uh, which is just the uh, liquid excrement of a sucking insect that will produce spittle. And then in the center, we've got uh, waxy scales called pine needle scales. And these are armored, armored scales that you'll see sometimes on hemlocks as well. So these might be confused with them, but they but they really do look a lot different. They don't have uh, the same number of the filaments look a lot different uh, and, and the like. You know, uh, the spider egg sacs. You know, you'll see little spiderlings inside those. So how do we slow the spread of the hemlock woolly adelgid? Uh, what we want to do is we want to uh, first of all in this part of the country we just want to be uh, on the lookout for the white waxy tufts of, uh, on the needles. And uh, you would want to report it in ways that we'll discuss at the end of this presentation. But in areas where hemlock woolly delta is, you know, you definitely don't want to have bird feeders uh, next to your hemlocks because in the event the birds flew from a plant, from a hemlock that was infested during the crawler stage, they could actually carry the crawlers to your hemlocks and that, that, could, that could spread it. Uh, you could use uh, chemical controls to uh, manage them in urban areas and biological controls in more natural areas to control them. So um, the chemical controls you know, are, are somewhat varied. There are some foliar sprays. Uh, there's also soil injections that, that can be used as well. And uh, the biological control here you see is a beetle uh, that likes to feed on the egg masses, which is a great way to reduce populations of insects. So let's talk about uh, chemical treatments. You know, the foliar sprays, you can use horticultural oil and insecticidal soap. That will kill them when the crawlers are out. Uh, you can use pyrethroid. Uh, they will also kill them when the crawlers are out or also uh, even somewhat later stages. Uh, and then, of course, you can use a systemic insecticide called the neonicotinoid, something like uh, imidacloprid. Uh, it works uh, quite well. Um, and uh, but uh, there are some uh, limitations to each of these options, these modes of applying insecticides. Uh, the foliar sprays are somewhat costly, and the drifts can have a uh, non-target effects. Uh, so, for example, if you are spraying uh, and there's some overspray from your tree, you could be affecting other insects with that insecticide, especially if you're using pyrethroids, which are highly toxic to a, a large number of insects. The oils and the soaps are only killing insects by smothering them. So uh, only the insects that come into contact with them during the spray would, would be affected. But the pyrethroids, the residue will kill insects for a longer period of time. Uh, the systemic insecticides are actually preferred because you're actually only applying them once every five to seven years because they accumulate inside the hemlock needles. Uh, it's costly and long and, and, and long lasting and you know, that, that uh, may have um, uh, some implications on, 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 on the ecosystem. Uh, but uh, the benefits are that the longer lasting control means you're only going to apply it once every five to seven years, and there's a lot less drift than with the foliar uh, applications. Whenever I talk about uh, imidacloprid and neonicotinoids, people get concerned uh, because they're worried about pollinators. Um, these are indeed uh, wind pollinated. And because you are uh, not spraying it over large areas, the impact on the pollinators are really uh, going to be somewhat minimal. So how do we apply uh, systemics? There's a non-invasive way. One way, as you can see uh, the photo on the left, this uh, person is uh, taking a imidacloprid uh, uh, and pouring it around the base of a tree so that it is uh, uh, can be taken up by the roots. Uh, alternatively, uh, there are these uh, very light injection injectors, soil injectors, which are basically a six inch probes that you can probe down into the base around the tree uh, and carry it around and you give it a couple of squirts uh, based on the dose, of course. Uh, and that would be another good way to get it to the roots. And then there are these tablets, uh, one common brand is called Cortect. Uh, that uh, you can just bury uh, a certain distance uh, underneath the soil uh, around the tree and then let the uh, uh, 
uh, let the rainfall uh, bring the uh, bring the material into the roots. This is an example of a trunk injection of a systemic insecticide. Uh, you can inject the imidacloprid uh, into the uh, base of the tree uh, using either a system that has plugs or a system that is uh, has, that does not have plugs. Uh, there are a number of systems that are available. A lot of the same systems that are used for uh, emerald ash borer are also used for injecting uh, hemlocks. And there are certain tricks that are involved uh, in, in, in how you do it so that you can actually get the material up into the tree. Now, as far as biological control, uh, biological control really is uh, the introduction of natural enemies from uh, the country of origin. So in this case, they have been imported from Japan. Uh, they've also been imported from other parts in uh, Southeast and uh, uh, Asia, other parts as well as uh, Southern Asia. Uh, and uh, a lot have been introduced, uh, mainly lady beetles. Um, and this is because there are a few natural enemies that feed on them in North America. So uh, here's some examples of the predatory beetles. Uh, all of them, whether they be the uh, adult beetles, the uh, simnus, so there's this black beetle on the top left. Uh, it has a nice uh, larvae that's covered with wax that's feeding on uh, the egg masses and the eggs. Uh, there's also uh, uh, a, uh, another one called a Laracobius, uh, which has also been introduced, which has the same uh, habitat, uh, same habits. And uh, you know, they can be quite effective at removing populations of beetles of uh, hemlock woolly adelgids. So uh, there's a number of studies that show that uh, these uh, natural enemies are effective at reducing the densities because they have multiple generations a year and their development in sync with hemlock woolly adelgid and they're adapted to a lot of multiple environments. But you know, because they're not instantaneous, uh, it takes some time in getting uh, control uh, at a particular site. It's quite possible to integrate both biological and chemical control. Uh, and I'll show you that as one suggestion that they recommend uh, around a recreation area where you have some rather high value uh, hemlock trees, these uh, dark uh, triangles with the number four inside of them. Uh, these are the trees that you want most protected, and this is where you would actually probably apply insecticide on a regular basis to keep these trees alive. And then uh, there's there's an outer ring beyond that where you could uh, uh, treat them maybe for uh, one or two, for maybe two cycles uh, with the uh, insecticide, uh, with another outer ring where you could treat them maybe only once. And then beyond that point, you could release predators so that the predators in the forest could actually be responsible for the for the long-term control. So what this does is it protects the individual high-value trees with insecticides and protects the rest of the forest through biological control. Uh, similarly, if you have a riparian area, which is a, a sort of stream where you want to be able to keep that stream um, around uh, surrounded by hemlocks you'd want to have some nurse trees that could be uh, producing more seed to keep uh, repopulating that area with hemlock trees and you'd sort of have that same kind of approach you have uh, a focal point where you're releasing the uh, predators and then a focal point where you're releasing where you're using the uh, uh, pesticides for perpetual protection and you have trees with, uh, that are nearby with less protection uh, and, and so on. So eventually the idea is you're just trying to integrate your control. So what are my take home messages about managing hemlock woolly adelgid? Uh, hemlock is a very biologically important species. Uh, there are like 90 species of birds that are closely associated with hemlock forests and aquatic animals are more abundant in streams sheltered by hemlocks, especially in eastern North America. Uh, it's also economically important. 22% of the volume of softwood growing stock in the Northeast is, uh, is, is a hemlock and much of it is used for wood, pulp, paper, uh, uh, 
uh, lumber and and mulch. So it, it it's it's quite valuable. And uh, the long term management of, of this is most effectively accomplished through integrated pest management, where you use uh, where you monitor the populations and you will selectively target areas for biological control, and the most um, valuable or valuable trees to your management objectives, you can protect with chemical control. Now we're going to move into the hemlock woolly adelgid host plants. Um, as with the other webinars uh, in this series, this next section was originally prepared by Carrie Tauscher, but she wasn't able to be with us here today. So she gets all the credit for the preparation for that. I'm just the one presenting it. Um, and this one is, I mean, it's a little bit more simple than the past ones because it's really only focused on one plant. So we're going to go in a little bit more deeply in some of the identification characteristics. The first thing to notice about a hemlock tree is the form. Uh, it can be tough to distinguish between different evergreens, but it can be helpful to start out by looking at the overall shape of the tree. Hemlocks tend to have sort of delicate foliage. It looks a little bit wispy or floppy or droopy, uh, depending on how you want to describe it. Um, and the trees themselves are narrower at the top than the bottom. They've got this nice kind of classic cone shaped almost. In all three of these photos, you'll notice as well at the tip of the hemlock tree, it's sort of leaning over. Um, so the apical stem there is flopping to the side. And uh, it's almost like you can think of it like the hemlock is sort of waving at you um, on the top there. And that is a really good classic way to recognize a hemlock tree. Now, of course, as with everything, there are exceptions. Um, here are a few of them. So the first is uh, weeping form hemlocks. Those obviously um, have all of these long trailing branches and so they don't have that sort of classic tip that's flopping over. Uh, the second is in hemlocks that have been sheared. They don't have that uh, apical tip anymore to flop over at all because it's just been chopped off. Uh, so it's not something that's always going to work for identification, but it is a telltale sign when it is present. Here is an example of a mature hemlock tree. It's sort of open and sparse. Uh, some of you might spot that it has two co-dominant stems, which is not great, but that's, that's not what we're focusing on here today. Um, you'll notice on this tree, it's a little bit hard to see in this picture, but it does have that waving tip at the top, and it has that classic sort of droopy, sparse, sort of fluffy foliage. Um, so next th thing that you want to look at are the needles. Uh, hemlock trees have very short needles. They're usually shorter than an inch in length. Uh, they're often closer to a half inch or less. They also aren't in any sort of ranked formation and instead tend to radiate out at different angles from the twig. So you'll notice here that's really it's radiating, radiating out at all sorts of different angles, um, generally at the top, but you'll occasionally get some sticking out the bottom. This is part of what gives the hemlock tree their light, fluffy texture that uh, I've been mentioning already. Here you can really get a good look at those needles wrapping around the twig in a sort of loose arrangement. Um, and if you flip over the branch, that brings us to our next trait that's really distinctive on hemlocks, which is the underside of the needle. Um, if you compare these needles, so this is the top of the needles to the underside, you'll notice that the underside of the needles have a much lighter color to the top of the needles. The tops are sort of this dark glossy green, whereas the underside is this pale, almost sage color. It's sort of a minty sage color. Um, that's because the underside has these distinctive pairs of white stripes. You can see it pretty well here. 
Um, and that is another excellent sign that you're looking at a hemlock. Finally, for our identification traits, we have the cones. The cones on hemlocks are tiny compared to a lot of other evergreen trees. Um, they're, you might be familiar with them because they're generally the sorts of cones that you find in Christmas crafts. Uh, they are very smooth. They don't have a lot of sap or resin on them. Um, and they have uh, very minimal scales or sort of kind of cute little tiny cones. Uh, there's nothing really sharp about them and they're overall very delicate looking. If you actually come across a hemlock willy adelgid, we would greatly appreciate it if you reported it. Uh, the methods that I'm going to tell you about today can also be used to report other invasive species. And we have a wide variety of them. First is a website called eddmaps.org or edmaps.org. Uh, and it's associated collection of apps. Uh, the one for the Great Lakes region where we are in Indiana is Great Lakes EDN. Uh, you have to actually search for that specifically. Otherwise, it pulls up a banking app and you can't exactly report invasive species to a banker. I suppose you could, but they wouldn't really know what to do with that information. Um, anyway, so uh, there's a different app for each part of the country, as well as apps for Canada uh, in different sections of Canada. There's also a more general uh, EdMaps app, uh, and you can use uh, either uh, the more general one or the one that's specifically for your area, depending on your preference. The upside of using the more um, general one is it has basically all the invasive species across the entire country that we're worried about. So if you're someone who travels around a lot, that might be better for you. Whereas the regionally specific ones are useful because you don't have to scroll through all these different invasive species that you're not very likely to encounter. For example, uh, there are invasive species that are big issues in Florida that I am unlikely to encounter here in Indiana because it's just too cold for them. Uh, and the opposite is true. There are some things that um, are issues or potential issues here in Indiana that probably aren't going to be a problem in Florida. So that way, I you know we don't have to look at them if we look at the regionally specific apps. Uh, these apps also have um, the things that are already here, so the invasive species that are already here, as well as the ones that we're concerned might get introduced at some point in the future, and so we're trying to keep a lookout for them. And um, so once you've submitted a reporting on these apps. They are reviewed by experts. So somebody does actually go in and look at your report and determines if it's something that definitely looks like an invasive species of concern, if um, it's probably not an invasive species of concern and is instead one of the lookalikes, or if it's something that they can't really tell, but maybe they want to follow up on. There is also a phone number that you can call, 1-866-663-9684, and you can submit a report in that way. Uh, in addition, uh, most uh, parts of the country have a uh, email address that you can email in reports to. Here in Indiana, you'd want to do that through the DNR, but it's going to vary, again, depending on where you are. So that's why I haven't put that, uh, that email address here on the screen. We have a website as well for Indiana called reportinvasive.com. This website uh, has all sorts of information about how you report an invasive species, as well as information um, about you know, management, uh, details about the species themselves, other resources. So it's, it's got a wide variety of things there. Lastly, I always tell people, if you forget all of this, you forget all these places you're supposed to report, um, just contact someone who works on invasive species and tell us what you think you saw. Uh, we, we usually talk to one another. Uh, usually if you're studying invasive species, you're kind of looped into that whole network. So most people, if you get in touch with them, uh, if they work on invasive species, they should get your report to the right person. When you do report, there are some things that are really helpful for us to get. First, please write down where you are. With something like Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, um, it's particularly useful to know where it is because um, 
it will often, there'll be uh, samples on the tree that we can go back at a later date and check. So the individual adelgids aren't, you know, running around between trees like you might see on something like a spotted lanternfly, um, which is not to say that they won't spread, they certainly will spread, um, but they're a little bit more stationary than other invasive insects. Please do also take a picture. Pictures are incredibly helpful to us. It helps us determine if you've seen the species you think it is, or if it's maybe one of the lookalikes. Um, the pictures are really, really useful. Uh, particularly if we go back later and it's not there anymore, at least we'll have that photograph. And then finally, if you can collect a sample, that is also uh, uh, something that lets us confirm the identification. Uh, with something like a hemlock woolly adelgid, it's probably best not to try and collect an individual adelgid, but instead break off one of the small twigs on the hemlock that has the adelgid if you can, um, and then put that into some sort of container like you can use a water bottle or any other sort of container that you have that you can seal where the hemlock uh, woolly adelgid won't get crushed in transit. So if you have any questions, we are happy to take them now. Um, just as a reminder, we have a report invasive website that has further information about uh, the hemlock woolly adelgid. We also uh, post updates on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at the handle report invasive. So if you'd like to get updates, that's a good place to follow us. And I've also got all of our contact information on the screen right now if you'd like to get in touch with us later. Um, and so now I'm going to open up the floor, and if anybody has a question for Cliff, please feel free to put that into the chat. Well, it doesn't look at this point that we have any questions, but again, folks, you will be getting an email tomorrow from me um, with contact information, the survey, and also, you will be able to uh, get the information if you would like CEUs for this live webinar. Um, with that, I think I'm going to close the meeting. Thanks, Cliff and Elizabeth, um, for these great series of these half hour sessions. Everything we needed to know about some of these invasive pests and diseases, it's been, it's been a lot of good information. And I'm sure folks have learned, or learned a lot from our feedback. So thank you, everyone. And um, I hope to see you at the next EAB University sessions, which probably we will start in the fall. Thank you. Thank you.